Hello and uh, welcome to Alles auf dem Tisch, which is German for everything on the table. And uh, my name is Robert Cummings. I'm a studio owner operator in Berlin, Germany. I'm originally from Canada, but I've lived here for about 30 years. And uh, today we're talking about masks and we have a guest from Tallahassee, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, Megan Mansell. So yes. hello, Megan. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and some of your areas of expertise. Sure. Um, so it's it's varied and I've, I've been in these fields for a long time. Um, so I've seen different sides of it. Um, I'm a subject matter expert in immunocompromised and special populations integration for the public sector under federal regulatory compliance, which are um, people who kind of don't fit the mold, um, immunocompromised, profoundly disabled, undocumented, and the, the rights of workers who serve people in these special communities, um, including personal protective equipment for those workers and the rights of the employees if they themselves have disabilities within the workplace. And then I have a background in PPE applications for hazardous environs, which is which masks or respirators work when and why, and why that's important based in uh, given particle behavior and, uh, and, and how we figure out how to match the risk with what, what the PPE need is or the personal protective need is for a given person in a given setting. So, so how are masks desi uh, designed for a given application, what are the parameters and uh, what's the intention with regards to source control? It, it really, everybody kind of lumped everything into one basket and suddenly um, we're, we're comparing handmade cloth masks with um, something highly tested with, with standards for viral control and, and everybody's just assumed that everything does the same thing. There are different grades for whether you're coming into contact with oils, there are different sizes depending on, you know, your face structure and your individual health need is a huge part of that process that has been really disregarded and neglected. So I have some photos that can kind of help illustrate um, the different things that you see within the public sector. And so before I get into to PPE, we need to talk about, you know, filtration standards. And for COVID sized particulates, the, the minimum viable particle size is what matters. Um, that's the smallest particle that is going to be able to make an, an impact on the health. Um, and so the minimum COVID size particle is 0 0.06 microns, which puts it in the radically behaving particulate range of aerosols, which are sub 0.3 micron aerosols. The aerosol range is anything under five microns. Droplet range is over five microns. And so from the beginning of the pandemic, people were told, well, this is a droplet based pathogen. So you need barrier methodology and they're working on hand sanitizer and surface sanitization because mm -hmm. they're saying, if you get away from that six foot drop from the droplet, um, then you're going to be, you know, doing more to, to mitigate the spread here. Mm -hmm. um, and then about 10 months ago, all of the regulatory agencies kind of finally said, no, this is primarily an, an airborne pathogen with, with airborne spread. And so the difference there is airborne mitigation looks entirely different than droplet okay. mitigation, but we never changed our mitigation measures and we never changed our PPE. Um, we never reconsidered test site environments and the PPE being misused at, at test site environments. So one of the um, things I'll, I'll start with are, are cloth masks and cloth masks are unregulated apparatuses um, yeah. that, so you don't know one to the next of, of which one um, would have a, a more of a fit. Um, and fit and leakage is really important with PPE and aerosols because 3.2% mm -hmm. leakage equates to 100% inefficacy. And something has to be considered 90% effective to be considered mitigating by the CDC okay. standards of, um, of, of mitigating apparatuses. And so mm. what you see here is not only the cloth masks, 
But what I want you to see here is right in front of the cloth mask, you see the exhale plume getting through. This is not Tyndall wow. lighting used. So that means what you see with the naked eye begins at 50 microns. And what, what you see here um, is, is certainly not 0 0.06 micron radically behaving particulate. So what you're actually seeing coming out in these pictures is droplet being forced through a membrane. This is a surgical mask plume. And again, going right through the mask. Um, and the more fitted an apparatus, you start to get into the path of least resistance. And that's why it's important to note that cloth masks are, are fully unregulated because you don't know, it, is the matter going through it or is it going straight out the sides? Now imagine yeah, if this yeah. guy is sitting next to you on an yeah. airplane, this yeah. is going right in your face. Yeah. And so yeah. um, this is a, the exhale plume taking the path of least resistance. It's going up through the nose bridge and out both sides. And so if there's two of us wearing this kind of mask, we're just blowing this right in each other's faces, which yeah. is not a good way to try to mitigate exposure to an airborne pathogen. Yeah. This is a test site administrator wearing okay. a valved mm -hmm. N95 respirator. And you can see this focused plume of particulates coming out of here. And what happens here, and what's an important part to talk about aerosol behavior here, is that you, you get into fluid dynamics um, and, and mm -hmm. aerosol dynamics here. It, it's a good comparison to think of water in your garden hose when you just turn it on and it's just kind of trickling out. If you put yeah. your thumb over the end of it, you're gonna increase the trajectory of the right. matter being emitted. And you're also going to keep that matter concentrated together as yep. you have increased the trajectory. And when you have a membrane that it's going through, like yep. on a mister setting, um, you have where you can take the larger droplet and force filter it into forced aerosolization of droplet through a membrane, mm -hmm. um, just like you take larger water droplet and then you have this fine mist all of a sudden. You're changing the behavior of different particulates. Mm -hmm. Now, 90% of your respiratory emissions are sub 0.3 micron, um, I'm sorry, sub three micron aerosols. Okay. And so when you have that much matter being emitted, not blocked by this at all, um, things like this really matter. This is an unvented N95. And, and you still see everything getting out. Um, and these are designed to protect the wearer and also must be right. fit tested. And uh, medical consent and medical clearance are also the part of the, the process with any fit tested apparat apparatus. Uh, medical consent is an important part of that conversation because an apparatus that is fitted enough to mitigate aerosols also decreases oxygen after extended periods of wear. And so if you work in an environment where you're having to wear a respirator for extended periods of time, you, after your fit test assessment, generally would be moved up into a higher grade respirator that has a filtered airline um, to accommodate oxygen okay. loss um, for extended yep. wear. And so it's also important to say, when you're pulling in on this apparatus that you're wearing all day long, you're also pulling in other matter. So if you're wearing them into a restroom, you're picking up matter from flush plumes. And if you're dropping them or setting them on surfaces, the area right in front of your mouth and nose is a very moist, porous environment in a mask, which is prime for biological amplification, which is right. um, creating more of, of that nastiness. Um, but I had said that minimum infective dose was a, a pretty important thing to get into in right. regards to PPE. Because what matters when you look at this, what matters when you look at this administrator yeah. putting this plume right in your car window is that COVID is a very low minimum infective dose pathogen. And so the current understanding is that 
you emit 100,000 COVID sized virions in one minute. And mm -hmm. so in one minute, you breathe on average 16 to 20 times. So going with the, the larger number of 20, um, the current minimum infective dose is understood to be around at its most conservative estimate, a thousand virions. So you take a hundred thousand, you divide it by 20 breaths in a minute, and you are able to come to the conclusion that one exhale has enough viral matter in this concentrated plume to infect five or more people at the most conservative estimate. So right. it's really important to highlight that we were put under the impression that masks were able to function as source control when this was still understood to be a droplet based pathogen that went completely out the window with airborne with aerosol behavior and so so people are wearing these thinking that they're keeping others safe that they can go about their business even though they're not feeling well but aerosols remain aloft for hours even days in enclosed spaces so um if you were to go up a 20-story building and you just get mm -hmm. in at the bottom and you light up a cigarette yep and you just smoke as you go up and you're you know you have smoke mm -hmm. accumulating around you in the elevator when you get off on the 20th floor some of that will billow out behind you but if it's not a well ventilated space some will stay behind think of how long it would take to go up in the elevator okay were right. you in there two minutes were you in there three minutes is that a hundred thousand virions is that two hundred thousand virions that you're emitting into respiratory range within an enclosed space that's not mm -hmm. going to settle you can leave enough matter behind to infect other people in a space like that and have zero people present for transmission yeah. so we we have people with a, a gross misunderstanding of things being able to be used interchangeably um, when, when that's something that desperately needs to be corrected. Um, and, and then you need to get into kind of a self-evaluation. How do you feel? I, I feel like most people have already assessed their own level of risk. I don't think people are really running around like chickens with their heads cut off do you or someone you're in direct contact with consider themselves newly since the beginning of COVID or, or pre previously, but having acknowledged it then, you probably behave differently then. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself to be immunocompromised? Right. And if so, what are some meaningful measures that you can take to improve your chances against a, a, a pathogen with a 99.8% survivability rate? Right. If you're of that 0.2% of the population, what accommodations can we make to the public sector that don't infringe on free will and personal risk mitigation of others? What can we do that will keep you as a transmissible individual from putting this directly in someone else's face? And it's, it's largely behavioral controls. It's largely identification. And it's starting to use logic in application of places like adult care facilities and nursing homes where um, you you can use testing strategically before accessing those populations for shift work or visitors after you're able to do a sweep through the facility or an absolute quarantine of a facility of, of eight to 14 days which is the current onset period and i'm not recommending that for everybody just yeah. for protected, isolated populations, then you can do checkpoint testing um, before shift work. It, it doesn't work for a new resident because they could have been exposed and they just might not have onset of symptoms yet. And, and once you're in a contained space, we've you know been able to show that you can infect multiple people very quickly once you are transmissible with this. So making sure that, that you're not before accessing um, populations it, in, in New York, the nursing home disaster <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that we've seen where transmissible individuals were put in incredibly vulnerable populations. I, I'm not really sure what anybody else thought would have yeah. happened there. Um, and and those are already facilities that have really high 
um, no, it, it's the nosocomial atmospheres have really high atmospheric viral load anyway, because you have a, a lot of elderly people are kind of never well, they're always yeah. kind of coughing around. So yeah. you may not consider this a symptom. You may just consider this, oh, well, Bob's just hacking up a lung again or something. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do have people like that. So it's not as much of a red flag when those people are coughing. As but one on a, a slightly related issue, what about schools and, and, and children? Should they, should they be wearing masks? No, because child size masks are completely unregulated. There are no efficacy standards for child size masks. And there's there's so much to go on about children. But tooth, tongue, and lip placement is a requirement for a linguistic onset and development. Right. They have to be able to see faces to be able to read social cues and emulate caregiver social cues. Um, it, it's so critical for social and emotional development that we mm -hmm. reach um these milestones at specific developmental stages when you miss these milestones they can take years to remediate if that's even possible um but the other issue with schools is we're, we're not doing enough to allow people to meaningfully identify themselves we're we're giving everybody um this one measure and mm -hmm. we're not considering like oh, hey, the respiratory systems of children are far different than the respiratory systems of adults, hmm. and their their breathing function is entirely different than adults. So we can't just swap an apparatus designed for a, an adult or make-believe apparatus that someone has made for an adult and convinced them to use and slap it on a child and say that that child is safe in any yeah. capacity. Um, and so what really works with medically vulnerable children is identification and controls, engineering controls on HVAC systems and uh, what can you do to increase airflow and what can you do to decrease mm -hmm. the number of times that that child is going to come into, into contact with mixed populations. And how vulnerable do you consider yourself? Are you just saying, we want to take some extra precautions, we're not ready yet? Or are you saying, we only receive delivery services that are no contact, we work from home, we have zero outside contact with other people, but we want our child to socialize. Yes. In that instance, um, where I live, we have uh, a lot of the schools have overflow learning cottages. There are these little portable buildings that yeah. you know usually have their own HVAC right. system okay. and their own bathrooms. Those make perfect top tier. I have created four different tiers and explained them. Um, could we, could we use like the, the, the peanut um, uh, um, yeah, yeah, analogy exactly. that you have? That, yeah, sure. peanut allergy. Um, so there, there's two different ways that we can look at a school setting when we have a child with a severe peanut allergy. And a severe peanut allergy is very much like a, a, a child who would be susceptible to um, COVID uh, because of the low minimum infective dose, it takes very little exposure to peanut for a child to um, have, have a severe reaction. So you have two options. You can either say the entire school, we're done with peanuts, don't you bring a peanut and then great grandma packs lunch huh. and they forget and then we're putting an epi pen and a kid's leg on a playground while you call the wee wee wagon or um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh or you say we we have a third grader who has a severe allergy to peanuts can you uh wash your hands brush your teeth and change your shirt before coming to school and just please never pack it in lunch it's not just that you can't ever have this ever again just you in this class, can you commit to this? And the, the incident rate is far lower when we have that buy-in ahead of time where, yeah. where we have people committing to help this one particular child. And we gave them a choice in the matter. And that gave them their own intrinsic responsibility um, that, yeah. that they're, they're going to remember more than just like, oh, my kid, that's like all my kid likes to eat or something. You know, there, there are kids out there. Yeah. who um, we, we can be safe, we can be accommodating in a reasonable manner for that yeah. one, one child without it having to be the control of everybody else. 
And that's very much like protecting special populations. We need to know who they are. We need identification. And so I have um, on my, my article on ra it's rational ground forward slash Goldilocks. Um, <laughs> oh, that's our timer. <laughs> oh, sorry. I would, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, that's a good we're, we're at a good <laughs> spot right there that we we've got to um 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 um, um uh, uh, get uh, away from the one size fits all yes. solution that we're just like you said putting a blanket on the entire thing and look at and, individual and there solutions. There should be total normalcy as an option yeah. for people. Field trips, yeah. visitors. It, it should be based on you understand your personal health. Your health is personal, and, and that should remain private. Um, but we we can do things to better accommodate even the most um, you know immunosusceptible person, right. as long as they're the ones taking the responsibility for their own personal protection. Just like uh, PPE is only going to protect the wearer right. when it's a high grade respirator appropriately fitted right. to the person wearing it and matched to the given particle size. Um, I, <laughs> so. Exactly. I, I, um, um, maybe we could leave um, uh, the viewers with um, um, some some addresses where they could find out more about what you've written. Sure. Sure. And uh, um, I have yeah. um, I have two articles in particular up on uh, rationalground.com. Um, one is uh, called Goldilocks and the four tiers of just rationalground.com forward slash Goldilocks. And the other one is called masks are not source control also yeah. on rational ground. And then I'm on Twitter at Mamasaurus Meg. I'm a zero inbox kind of girl. So huh. if you reach out, if you have questions and message me, I will get back to you um, <laughs> because I think that's an important part of this. And, engaging yeah. with people it's not worth just shouting to the abyss yeah. and um so <laughs> and Excellent. then um yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i'm uh, i'm really glad we had this chance to to have this uh this meeting and discussion and uh give an introduction to some of the the uh the ideas that that you've been working on i and, just think uh, it helps yeah. if we're incredibly specific with people when it comes to things that if we don't give them too much information or we give them the wrong information, it could kill them. So, you know, not a bad thing to be specific There's about. There's been a lack <laughs> of specificity, right? It, we haven't been looking at the problem specifically. We've been, yeah. No, we've been generalizing. We've been making it emotional. Look at it as a particle. It removes yeah. all emotion when you just see it as a particle being filtered. So excellent. Uh, <laughs> And with that note, I think we'll we'll wrap it up and uh, look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Megan. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>